I am Amanda Lowe. I am the program coordinator for Freedom and Citizenship. Um, and I am just going to give everyone an overview of the year that um, our FNC students have had and the, and the hard work you guys have done all year long um, as a way of sort of reminding you guys of and celebrating the work that you guys have done. And then also um, for, for people who weren't a part of the program this past year to give them a sense of the, of the big scope of um, what we accomplished. Um, so if you guys will remember back all the way back in July, um, we started FNC by exploring um, by exploring early political philosophy of Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. Um, you guys then had three weeks of reading um, a ton of political philosophy, which included um, debating the role that the law should play in governing the state. You talked about um, should should who should be included in a society who should be excluded you de you debated um, what the best ways to um, make political change are and how far you'd be willing to go if you were staging a protest um, and towards the end of the summer you concluded by reading incredible texts by um, James Baldwin um, Du Bois um, Frederick Douglass and thought a lot about race and ethnicity um, and the roles those those issues play in forming both citizenship and your own identity. Then during this academic year, you guys learned a ton about how about active citizenship and how to participate in in democratic fashions. Um, by, engage, by engaging civically and developing civic engagement projects together. Um, Everybody will see that the incredible projects that our students made this year um, range from mental health to food insecurity to school segregation. Um, and during, during the year, you guys learned about um, how, to, how to research different organizations that are involved in your various topics, what those organizations do, how they give information to people to help them get involved. Um, you interviewed people from those organizations um, and learned more about your topics that way. Um, you got to uh, then develop features to help engage others, um, which you'll show. Um, and we finally have concluded here with at Civic Night and we'll see the display of the full um, projects tonight. Um, so I just wanted to celebrate you guys because this has been a huge commitment that you've made um, and you guys have done a stellar job and it's been so um, fun getting to know you all um, and getting to celebrate you. So with that, why don't we um, begin our presentations? So the first group that's going to go is um, tonight is a group that worked on food insecurity um, and their TAs uh, were Stephanie and Ariana. Okay, hi guys. Um, my well, name is Samaya and our group's civic project focused on food insecurity. So this is an issue that like not many people come to terms with and how real it could be. So in our project, we came up with fact sheets, arts, op-eds, and much more to show how real this issue is and the change that we want to see. So yeah. So um, one thing the students were really passionate about, so Rebecca did this part um, and they really wanted to incorporate art to kind of show that this isn't sort of just like a, uh, an issue of data, but you know, there's real people and kind of emotions behind it. Um, so Rebecca worked really hard on these to kind of create these sort of graphic representations to uh, encourage people to be more conscious of the way that we uh, talk about food and the way that we talk about food waste and you know, make it make it a community issue because even if you you, you yourself don't necessarily su suffer from hunger, certainly um, that you know people who do. Yeah, um, thank you, Rihanna, for that. I also wanted to share one of the most important things that I've learned 
throughout the years is probably that art has a lot to do with like every situation. Um, even though hunger is a delicate topic for some people, um, art makes it more of like an important matter for people to actually understand and to try to make a difference. So, yeah. Um, and these were some images created by uh, Yasin to, that were kind of her own expressions of how she kind of felt about also trying to encourage people. And you can see there's some quotes. There's one, um, there's one about mother, that Mother Teresa gave that I really liked somewhere within this gallery. Uh, yeah, so, so once again, kind of to reiterate sort of the art how, how important artistic expression is to sort of our project and the way that uh, people can engage with these sort of issues. Um, so Geraldine and I have worked on the fact sheet and our topic is definitely food hunger and also food disparities. Um, so food disparity relates to multiple factors such as high unemployment rate, low income population, racial and ethnic discriminations, which are like current, the current topics that are still going on in our society. And subsequently it is closely associated with food insecurity, homelessness and health issues. In New York City, home insecurity, homelessness, food inequality and poverty thrive mainly because of the food disparities being that New York City is such a diverse city. So uh, why is this an important issue and how, who has been affected? An estimated 1.09 million New Yorkers are food insecure, which makes New York City's food insecurity rate about 12% above the national rate and 21% higher than New York State. 70% of children have limited access to healthy food and they're more likely to experience food insecurity due to their reliance on adults for food. East New York has the biggest food swamp in the city with 27 fast food places in the 11207 zip code and 14 fast food places in the 11208 zip code. Uh, many undocumented immigrants and the people living in the United States on temporary visas are not eligible for SNAP benefits, which prevents them from getting free food. Uh, and also 29% um, of Hispanic New Yorkers and 20% of Black New Yorkers experienced food insecurity in March, 2021. So um, this is just a few factors that is currently going on for many years, not to mention that due to COVID-19 pandemic, food insecurity has increased dramatically. Therefore, um, something needs to be done and this is why we're having this presentation over here. Um, so ways to help. Um, so there are many ways you can help. There exist organizations that set up food pantries in different locations throughout the five boroughs of New York City, including Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, in which volunteer work is needed. Um, we will provide um, all of you a list of organizations you can sign up for or go to yourself if you're food insecure and are facing this issue. Um, if you are under 18, if you are under 18, you can volunteer to work in related organizations such as Food Bank for New York City, Riverside Farm Share, uh, New York Food Pantry, and for anyone else, um, 18 or not, uh, you may also try to utilize your resources to help your community directly in addition to volunteering, um, to volunteering such as gathering your peers to start your own club or organizations to bring more awareness um, to this topic. However, if you are if you are unable to volunteer, there are other ways you can help. 
by sharing these resources, this website, this fact sheet. And if you yourself are food insecure, there are these are some places located in the Bronx and um, Brooklyn and other boroughs. However, you can always visit the website, Get Food New York City. Um, and there's a further resources section and it will show you more um, places you can visit or you can also call 331 to ask for emergency um, food. Hello everyone, my name is Yasin and I believe as of now we have a little bit of understanding what my group projects was about. With that said, I would like to ask you a few questions. Have you ever craved food? Have you ever felt the need to eat from dumpsters? Have you ever had the thought of going home knowing you don't have something to eat? Or have you ever felt restless because you are hungry? Well, if you answer no to all these questions, there's something you should know. I woke up scratching at my stomach as if I have allergies. I rubbed and rubbed, but it wasn't going to stop hurting. I tried to get up from my bed, but I couldn't walk straight. I heard noises and felt kicks in my stomach. It hurts. It felt like my organs were fighting each other to death. But why? Why? Why do I feel lifeless? When I finally made it to the yard, I stood over the avocado tree. I saw its branch waving back and forth. At that moment, the only thing I wanted to do was shut the noises in my stomach up. I tried jumping up the tree, but instead got blown over by the wind. I had no strength, no wig to stand against the force of the wind. Am I the only one who feels this way? Are there any doctors who can treat me? I think I'm terminally ill. Yeah. Um, I chose that picture especially to align with the, the poem. As you can see the quotes inside, the other one was like, I will eat everything while the opposite side was saying, I will eat anything. So I just want to like to remind everyone that do not waste food, please. Because whenever like you say, I cannot eat everything or like you, even like if you cannot eat it, you can donate or do something about it, but do not waste it while other people are trying to find food from trash and dying from hunger. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this was in a, in a little op-ed that I wrote just following having done some research and also having um, interviewed some people that worked with a uh, food pantry at Columbia. Uh, as long as people have been around, hunger has been an issue. Early humans trying to find edible foods then evolved into hunter-gatherers, hunters and farmers, up to the point where we are now, being as advanced as we think you are. You think that hunger, especially in a developed country like the United States, would not be a big an issue as it is. However, hunger still affects people who you wouldn't believe would be affected by this university students. For example, at Columbia University Food Pantry, visits are at 300 to 400 per month and were 500 at the peak of the pandemic. These numbers are still much higher than 100 pre-pandemic visits. The situation at Columbia can be viewed as a microcosm of what is happening throughout the city with 1.2 million New Yorkers experiencing food insecurity prior to the pandemic. That number ballooned to 2 million during COVID. Now that the pandemic appears to be in the rearview mirror, these numbers have started to go down, but it is still important to remember the 1.2 million New Yorkers who have suffered from food insecurity prior to the pandemic. This figure may also have gone up due to job loss and inflation caused by the pandemic, but it might last for a long time. An issue, of fix, like, an issue like this affects people of color disproportionately and those who reside in areas of the city that are trying to buy their food swamps and food deserts. Yeah, and 
that was kind of, there's a few other portions that we won't go into now, um, but you all have the opportunity to, to look at it because the students all worked really hard on their individual portions. Thank you so much. Thank you to our uh, food waste and hunger group. Does anybody in the audience have any questions for this group? We have a time for just a few. A lot of applause for a lot of hard work. Looks like Christine has a question. Oh, thank you, Christine. Yeah, I loved hearing, I, I loved every part of this presentation. It was so good. And I was really like intrigued by this term food swamp that came up a couple of times. Um, I don't think I'd heard that term before. Could you talk more about what a food swamp is and why it's a problem? Uh, yeah, so in essence, like I think most people have heard of uh, what a food desert is. It's like where people don't have access to a place where they can buy groceries and stuff like that. But a food swamp is where people do have access to food, but it's more of like fast food and things that you normally wouldn't want to be consuming on a regular basis. Very interesting. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Hunger Group and Food uh, Waste. Appreciate it. You all can view the rest of the website, which has more information, much more on it. Um, and next up is our schools and school segregation group. Hi everyone, my name is Hiba and I was the TA for the school segregation group. Um, so despite being one of the most diverse cities, New York City has the most segregated school system in the country and we decided to explore this issue. Um, so first up, we have Emily who will introduce the issue and its importance. Hi, my name is Emily. Um, before I wanted to start, I wanted to introduce uh, my whole group. So I am a part of many students of this amazing group. We are joined with Juliana, Barama, Zeke, Naomi, Melanie, Geraldine, Emmerine, and Emma. For our group issue, we focus on school segregation. It is the idea that school segregation is currently and subtly going on. The reason we chose this matter is because it uh, it doesn't appear as clear as, as possible. And as students, we deserve to know the right as you do as well. Um, I wanted to continue with a little fun fact so we can continue with the next part. Um, did you know that the students uh, at better funded schools perform higher than those from lower funded schools? So with that, we'll continue with the fact sheet, which uh, Juliana and I worked on. Um, around some time, we worked on together to introduce our fact sheet, and we basically just wanted to put together some fun little facts for the readers and the audience to look over while reading the, the fact sheet and the website. So we included the, uh, the link of the articles that helps, that basically like fact checks our fact sheet. Uh, it's like the last page. Yeah, there you go. But we have it on Canva and we set up, I'll just read you like two of them and then we'll continue with Juliana. So students at schools with better funding perform uh, better than students at our lower funded schools from 2009 to 2012, as well as black students represent 17% of the public school student body, but account for 34% of the suspensions. Although New York City has the largest school district in the country, it is the most segregated. Black and Latino students make up 9% of the populations of specialized high schools this year, the lowest percentage yet on record. Charter schools in New York City are overwhelmingly segregated for Black and Latino students more so than traditional public schools. Thank you so much, Juliana and Emily. Now we're gonna move on to Brahma, who's gonna give a brief rundown of the history and the historical implications of segregation in New York City public schools. Hi, uh, my name is Barama and uh, we worked on the history sheet together because and we wanted it we wanted it to be like compelling and like informative of course and we wanted to make sure that our audience knew that a big part of understanding how school segregation affects us today is understanding where it came from uh, what events took place surrounding the issue in the past, 
and ultimately understanding how it has evolved into what we have today. So on our history sheet, we separated it into uh, three like separate time periods, you could say, um, to make it like sort of digestible. But the, the first um, section is the 1900s to 1955. That's on the page before that. Thank you. Um, and yeah, for example, like we talked about uh, before uh, Brown v. Board, we gave a historical context after the Civil War ended because of course, um, a lot of people, a lot of the people that school segregation affects today weren't even granted uh, citizenship or weren't seen as people until the end of the Civil War. So we made sure to include that. Um, unequal education was also very prominent um, in the US during times of Jim Crow laws and segregation, of course, because there was this doctrine that was really popular or popularized with the Supreme Court case Plessy versus uh, Ferguson or Plessy versus Ferguson, sorry. Um, but yeah, it established this precedent or doctrine that said um, schools or like resources in general amongst uh, segregated communities are constitutional as uh, only if it is um, uh, equal, but the conditions prove that it wasn't equal at all. So in our second section, uh, we focus on Brown v. Board of Education and what happened after that. And yeah, we just gave a brief rundown of what happened in that case. And it basically outlawed segregation in schools. So then this is when uh, integration started to happen. And in our more in our more recent section, the 2000s to present day, we focused on um, a couple like policies that were put in place to kind of combat uh, uh, this issue, but yeah. I'll pass it off to Zeke, who's gonna uh, focus on segregation today. Hi. Um, so yeah, school segregation is um, um, a ubiquitous issue in um, New York City and is one that's by no means insignificant. Uh, so it's really important that we talk about this matter because while it may not, well, to a lot of people, when this issue is brought up, they may think that it's one that doesn't apply to them, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to a large number of people, because it does. And um, yeah, so it's a, a significant issue that um, that um, we find crucial to talk about. Um, and as was previously mentioned, um, Black and Latino students are attending primarily um, uh, predominantly non-white institutions, while a significantly lower per, um, percentage of white students are. Um, and um, uh, there have been um, some efforts made to, to um, mitigate this issue. Um, most recently, I can think of Bill de Blasio's um, uh, uh, removal of the uh, gifted and talented program for, I believe, entry uh, elementary school students, who are, um, younger kids, kindergartners, um, where they basically take a standardized exam that places them in these uh, higher level courses at school. And um, I believe um, one statistic, uh, one, one statistic shown was that um, while Latino students make up about 60% of the, um, the, the, the kindergartners, they were, they only made up 16% of the gifted and talented program. And so, so, um, so um, the abolition of this program was one step toward addressing school segregation, but we see this issue manifesting in many different places. Um, I think um, the first thing that comes to mind uh, is the SHSAT. Um, we see only a handful of Black students being admitted to um, these 
top schools every year. I th though at the same time, it, the issue is one that that not only applies to um, only a handful of high schools, um, high schools all over the city, um, especially the screened high schools that um, when you apply, take a look at your um, your portfolio, your attendance, your grades. Um, a lot of Black and Latino students are um, being rejected at a significantly higher percentage uh, than white students. And um, these processes are arbitrary and no one really knows um what qualifies you for certain schools but it is it is just another demonstration of the effects of school segregation and um so melanie will uh, speak a bit more about the issue um yeah i think z gave a pretty good um just general rundown on how segregation is impacting NYC and just schools in general throughout all the nation. Um, for our website, I wanted to go through our website and kind of show off the different features that we have. And then later, Barama, Juliana, um, and everybody else will kind of um, go more in depth into our call of action. So first, if we go into the call to action, um, we talk a lot about school suspension here and how specifically um, women of color, Black women in schools are more likely to be um, affected by punitive measures or suspended. And so we have uh, um, just a general rundown of how we want to call to action or just how we wanna interact with school suspension in general and how FNC can help different schools throughout NYC to um, kind of speak on it. Then when we go back, we have a podcast section. Hey, Melanie. Um, mm -hmm. We only have one more minute left. So um, oh. let's let our students run through quickly what we have left. All right, so we have a podcast section. We have a history and facts section that we already went through. We have a poetry collection that has a bunch of different poems about school segregation, a couple essays on gentrification, flaws in our educational system, cultural segregation. And then this is just a calendar made by these people, I'm assuming, or just um, different people within New York City that helps families to have different um, dates on school events and et cetera, and to share their own experiences with school segregation. All right, and you can view the whole um, the whole web, web page there, which includes not only the 2022 students, but also what students created in 2017, 2018. And, uh, and that includes from this year, a podcast, poetry, and the fact sheet that they showed you. Do you guys want to share your, your call to action really quickly before we take questions? Yeah, Brahma and Julian, do you guys want to take that? Uh, yeah, sure. So our call to action, um, we said, we asked our um, audience to try to read the article and then after that, like reach out to like their schools, um, like faculty or whoever's in charge of like uh, having information about suspension and just ask about uh, suspension rates by race to kind of get insight on how that issue is um, present in their school or like, yeah. And then if you can uh, please send us, you know, everything that you gathered, all the info you got um, either on Insta or on our email, you can see it's right there. All right, are there any questions? I see uh, Michelle. Yeah, one of my questions were like, um, I think the podcast is an interesting way to share like what you've learned. Like how does the podcast situation work? Is it like purely anecdotal or you share the facts and um, research that you have learned before? Do you want to take that since you worked on the podcast? So, so could you repeat that? Well, my question. Yeah. Um, was the podcast like purely anecdotal, or was it like facts and um the resources that you have learned so far? 
Oh yeah, it oh, it was definitely both. Um, uh, for the most part, anecdotal because I was speaking from my personal experience in g- going to a pub- New York City public high school and working with a student um, that went to a, a New York private school and um, comparing, like, um, seeing what can be learned from the two vastly different experiences, but also involving statistics to ensure that it is grounded in um, facts and um uh, uh, real life events. Excellent. And you can not only listen to the podcast on the website, but you can also see all of the facts that they reference in the podcast on the website. Thank you so much, School Segregation Group, uh, for sharing that and sharing the call to action, which is an ask that you find out what are the suspension rates at your school and are they uh, racially disproportionate, as this news article suggests they are citywide, what's happening in your schools. And their call to action is to go ahead and, and find out that information, ask your principals, ask your administration, and let us know. Okay, next up is two groups on mental health. So we'll start with John and Christine. Good afternoon. My name is Anita Santana and our group with the help of our mentors, John and Christine, collab to create a project on mental health awareness for our communities. We will start off with a slideshow video that speaks on the importance of mental health and its serious effects. If there were issues with that screen share, that is my fault. I am sorry, um, but we have a fact sheet now, which I will pull up.
maybe while Christine is pulling it up, uh, the students who made it can start talking. Apologies about that, uh, but here it is. And I think Kiara is gonna get us started with these facts. Hello everyone, my name is Kiara and here are some of our facts that we made about on our mental health sheet about mental health. Being bullied at a young age can affect someone in adulthood and can cause lifelong psychological damage. Students who use social media for more than two hours daily are considerably more likely to rate their mental health as far as poor than occasional users. And 90% of people who die by suicide have experienced symptoms of mental health condition, of mental condition. And now I will pass it over to Chaba who will continue with our mental health sheet. Adding on to Kiara, nearly one in four people shot and killed by police officers between 2015 and 2020 had a mental health condition. 20% of the time, people are not able to complete physical tasks and 35% of the time, people are not able to focus their thinking in life due to depression. Lastly, 21% of people experiencing homelessness also have serious mental health issues. Now I'll pass it on to Ian. Hi, my name is Ian, and I'm going to be reading the first, the first three of our fact sheets. So our first fact, our first for this page is 35% of teenagers who are active on social media report, report worrying about people tagging them in an attractive unattractive photos. People with untreated mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. American Indian men face additional challenges such as historical trauma, cultural distress, poverty, geographic isolation, and suicide in the community that can cause increased stress. And I'll pass it on to Habiba to, uh, to read the last three. Sure. So to add on to Ian, 72% of U.S. adults say that they use at least one social media site. Young adults have the highest chance to have suicidal thoughts out of all age groups. Depression has been linked to a 50% increase in a person's risk of dying from cancer and a 67% increase from heart disease. Now we're going to move, uh, I'm going to pass it on to Inez, who will be talking about a bill that is currently in Congress uh, and that we find very important and helpful with our issue. For our call to action, we were looking at bills on the New York Senate website, and we came across Senate Bill S-1969 or Assembly Bill A-5019. We felt passionate about this bill because we want to first impact our schools, which we go to every day and make sure that ourselves and our peers have a safe environment to learn in. This bill also ensures that there will be social workers and psychologists more available to students in New York schools. It will guarantee that every school has a full-time social worker and a psychologist on duty. Okay. Okay, now hey guys, my name is Sage and I will be explain how you guys can reach out or help in any way. So you can call your local senator or local representative in um, Congress and reach out to see if they will be able to pass or help, um, how you say, help facilitate passing the bill in any way. I think we have, we have links provided for that in a, in a Google Doc. Hi guys. Okay, now I'll be reading a call to action script that our group created that we sent to our senators and assembly members in our district. Dear Senator S. Parker, my name is Tashai De Silva and I'm a high school student at Uncommon Charter High School and also participate in Columbia University's Freedom and Citizenship Program. And I'm also one of your constitu constituents. FNC is a nonprofit tuition free civic leadership program for high school students, and we are now developing civic leadership projects. 
My team and I are currently working on a mental health project and our goal is to create a website where we share information and awareness for our community. I'm writing to you now because I've seen what the lack of mental health awareness and support has done to my peers in my school. Like many other students, I feel that mental health has deteriorated in my community. My own high school has seen increase in physical violence and many mental health issues may have been worsened by the pandemic. I recently have been doing research into possible solutions to the mental health crisis in our schools and came across Senate Bill S-1969 such Assembly Bill A-5019, an act, an act to amend the ed education law in relation to the employment of mental health professionals by school districts. This bill would mandate schools to hire psychologists and social worker for every school district in the state. I found this bill compelling because if schools had more professionals available to help students do better and overcome mental health problems, we will have a safer school environment. I was wondering what your stance is on this bill and the reasons for your support or opposition. I hope that you will join your colleagues and co-sponsor the bill. Thank you. Thank you so much to our first mental health group. And now we'll pass the baton over to our second mental health group. I'll go ahead and screen share for our group. So I was working with Amiri with a wonderful group of students. And now that you guys can see everything, I think one of um, Joanna will get us started. Thank you, Julieta, for introducing our group. So me and Jamie are the first section and within Jamie and I section, we felt that the design of our website played a significant role in the way people are able to view and address mental health. When choosing the focal image of our cover, we felt as if it should portray something that's directly correlated to a positive mindset since ultimately that's the end goal of this website. The flowers represent the bright fulfillment and the image of the person signifies that anyone can feel these ways. Our color palette is and a mixture of vivid and monotone colors to express various emotions. This shows how our emotions are able to consistently flow up and down, which is, nat which is a natural feeling. As you look around the website, we hope that you get this calm feeling while also educating yourself on such a pivotal topic. Thank you, and we'll be passing it on to Kalir and Maya. Um, hi, everyone. So me and Maya are presenting the mental health facts for this presentation project. And some of the facts that we found were that Suicide accounts for 800,000 deaths globally each year with over 41,000 in the United States alone and is one of the main causes of death, death and specifically number four on the list worldwide. Then we have 50% of adults in the United States who have problems with substance abuse suffer from some type of mental illness. 20% of youth suffer from a mental health condition and one in every six experience a period of major depression. Only 44% of adults with diagnosable mental illness receive treatment. Treatment for mental health problems doesn't only consist of prescribed or OTC medication, things such as therapy, meditation, and holistic uh, uh, treatments uh, can also help treat symptoms. And then 70 to 90% of people who seek proper treatment for mental health uh, disorders witness a significant reduction in symptoms. <clears throat> All these facts just like ultimately shows that mental health isn't something that is discussed in our society as much as like other things, which needs to change and uh, needs to have more awareness brought about it. Uh, as you notice when I said uh, 70 to 90% of people who do seek treatment, witness a great reduction in symptoms just goes to show how that when there is a more awareness brought about it and people get the proper treatment needed they can and would be like more change within it when it comes to suicide depression and all other diagnoses and now i'll just be passing it on to maya uh thanks clear so yeah our when we were when we were developing this fact sheet we were really focusing on broad topics like gender, race, stuff like that. Um, so we, um, we put together the, um, the mental illnesses that would be most likely to be had by men, the one that would be most likely to have by women. Um, we've put together some things for like um, 
where you can call for help. We've put some coping strategies, strategies. Honestly, when we put it together this fact sheet, we were really just thinking like, what do people not know and how can we help them deal with the things that they now know because of the fact sheet? So it was more, it was really like, it was really more like info and solution type thing. So that is our fact sheet. Now I'm going to pass it on to our comic strip that was made by Mackenzie, Selena, and I forgot who else. Thank you, Maya. So this is our page. Um, it has comic strips and on the very bottom it has an advice poster. We created this page because we wanted to be able to share our research with as many different types of people as possible. Through visuals, we're hoping that the information is more engaging so that not only would it be pleasing to the eye, but also simple enough to get the information across. So one of the issues that we raised through our comics is school stress. My group mate, Mackenzie and I will dialogue the conversation between a student and their doctor. Hey, how's school going along? I actually have something to tell you. I have a big test coming up and I don't feel prepared. It's stressing me out. Well, I would recommend you to get a study planner to plan how much time to study throughout the day to alleviate stress and overstudying in the case of staring at your computer for too long. After you're done studying for three to four hours, take a snack break. That sounds good, but I think part of the problem is that I'm losing sleep from the stress. What can I do about that? After studying, you should find some time to do some exercises. You could jog a bit on your walks as well. It will release stress and also help you sleep better. You should also avoid having caffeine or large meals close to bedtime. Thank you so much for the advice. After two more comic strips, at the end, we have our advice poster. Some advice we suggest we suggested to help improve your mental health or to try something new, such as cooking, or to disconnect from the internet. Thank you for listening to our section. I'll now pass it to Serena for the next feature. Uh, hi guys, so um, our section uh, is in like resources. So talking about uh, the different ways we can access uh, mental health resources for the different groups, such as children, adults, and uh, teenagers. Um, and what we wanted to really focus on is the way the pandemic has impacted um, all of these groups. So with children, uh, kind of what we talked about is uh, the fact that they may have de developed more like anti antisocial personality, where whereas with um, adults and teens, they may have like developed some sort of anxiety or depression. And we kind of just highlighted that in our research. And uh, just like, yeah, uh, you talked about kind of the impacts school has, oh, sorry if you hear the notifications, <laughs> the impact school has had on like the situation and the way um, the pandemic has uh, affected that and like just included a bunch of resources to talk about it as well. And I will pass it off to Okimute to finish it off this part, I mean. <laughs> Thank you. And in order to deal with the effects that the pandemic has had on children, teens and adults, we have provided various resources for each group. It's important that we acknowledge how everyone deals with mental health, health, and the links will direct the user to ways on how to navigate their problems and the different methods that they can practice to overcome them. Now I'll pass it on to Katie. Thank you, Okimute. Um, I worked on the gallery. The gallery displays different areas of mental health and the ways art can be used as a medium for self-expression. The first work of art shown in the gallery is Narcissus by Caravaggio, which is known as the origin of the term narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder. Um, as you go through the gallery, think about how these works of art resonate with you, as well as their connection to different areas of mental health. Thank you. I think if that's the end of our both mental health groups, we would love to hear questions from everybody. And remember, you can view the whole website and there's so much that they could only show you and not go into there so you can learn more. So are there any questions from everybody? Wait, Hi. I'm sorry, we forgot our closing real quick, Jamie. Oh, I don't know. 
moment. Do you want to close us out for our, our group? Thank you. Yeah, no, sorry, I got shy. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, like, thank you, everyone, for listening to our presentation. Um, overall, we felt as if our message was to share about the struggles people face with mental health and how to deal with those struggles. Um, we hope that our information overall has helped you understand more about mental health and the resources that are actually available for you. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Julieta, for not letting us skip them. Are there any questions? Oh, it looks like you have a question. I have one. Um, how was the process of making the comic strip, by the way? Because that was really cool. So. Comic strip folks, how did you do it? That's Selena, Cheryl, and Mackenzie. Um, I guess I can answer it. Um, if anything, like Selena actually did most of like the drawing and stuff. And I believe what she told us was that so like we took like models from like Canva and we sort of um drew inspiration from that and like um like that that was like our reference so like the um comic strip looks a lot like the stuff you would find on canva and then the like dialogue and conversation were sort of just like scenarios that we thought of that we thought would be helpful and like most applicable to teenagers I have a question actually. Um, I know Christina and, Hul and um, John's group, you actually did two interviews with experts on mental health that are on the website. Can you tell us how you got these experts to come in and, and sit and talk with you? Lise, can you take that one? Yeah, of course. Well, um, I actually coordinated the emails and the interviews. Um, Christine helped me write out emails for the interviewees and we found people like Brandon Chapman who work at the, the Mental Health Association in New York State and they were really kind to, um, inter to allow us to interview them along with Dr. Marsh who's an assistant medical director at the New York Founding. And they gave us a lot of tips and advice that really helped out with our fact sheet and our slideshow. And yeah, it was really great to have the opportunity to interview people who are actually trying to make a change for the greatness of our mental health. That's incredible. So you just sent them an email and they said yes? Yes. Very cool. All right. We have one final project for everybody tonight, and that is our immigration group. Sorry, I, I think Ashley, you had a question, right? Sorry. Hi. I was like <laughs> Thanks. No questions. Um, I now have a new face here. So just to quickly introduce myself, um, I'll be the residential supervisor and the social work fellow this summer. So if you're working this summer, I'll get to see you. Um, I just want to say I'm so impressed. I'm actually a, a master's student at Columbia School of Social Work right now. So I will be a mental health professional in the near future. Um, and I feel like the, the two presentations are just the quality that we do at school already. So you're like doing master's level stuff. Um, and there was a lot of research involved. So it was so awesome. And the creativity, I'm just so impressed. So I would love to see this and maybe show some friends around if you guys are willing. Thank you, Ashley, for sharing that. That is a real vote of confidence. Um, and everybody can see it on our website. So that is good news. All right, immigration, you're up. Hello, um, we are uh, from FNC. We are doing, we were focusing on immigration or more specifically how we named it Immigrant Student Access Support. Um, our mission is not only to spread awareness about the challenges that immigrant students face in the New York City public school system, but also take action. Unfortunately, many immigrant children of the U.S. are constantly shut out of the world, and this typically starts with the education system. We believe that everyone deserves a quality education, no matter where you're born, what your roots are, or what religion you follow. 
Not enough people fight for equal education. Those that do are sometimes silenced. We have to break the silence. Uh, the way we're gonna do this is through our website, which goes over a couple of different things. Again, in this side, we've prepared the following. A video about the lack of support for post-secondary education for immigrants, an Instagram account, which can provide resources to students in the public school system of New York, a quiz which uh, tests your knowledge of immigration, an interview with uh, immigration expert Rose Valley Morales and ways you can take action against the issue. The first thing we'd like to show is uh, Michelle and Cynthia who work on a video on immigration. Um, so Michelle will be speaking. All right, um, as a kind of like a mini intro to this, um, this is basically just like a mini video about um, what immigrant high schoolers will like tend to face, um, like specifically in New York, but also just kind of anywhere in the US in general. Let me, guys, let me know if you can't hear this. In America, only 19% of Hispanics have a bachelor's degree or higher, and only 5 to 10% of undocumented students actually attend college. New York City's public education system does not provide adequate college and career planning support for such students. This is a big issue that we must bring awareness to because there is a giant lack of support for students who are immigrants. And this is something that we need to bring a change to because many of our students, friends and families come from such places where they do not receive the proper guidance that they could receive. Now just a quick excerpt, but you guys can watch the rest um, on the website. All right, um, to kind of just sum, sum up some basic things that kind of like get touched in the video, but just in general, basically when immigrant children come to the U.S., they tend to face a lot of struggles, especially in the education system. There's an isolation when it comes to language barriers, as in the U.S., most teachers, they tend to know English and most of the time are not required to know Spanish or really any other language. And not to mention that there's that immigrant children tend to also attend schools that will be in their community, which sometimes are lower income schools, meaning that they don't get the best support that they need. And most of the time will end up dropping out of school because they don't feel like there's anyone there to support them. And because of all these changing factors, they tend to have like a dwindling in mental health. And, and ultimately they just don't really thrive in the environment that we are giving them. Our next, uh, our next up, up is uh, Alina and Pauline with the uh, Instagram account. And this Instagram account is about Im immigrant student support, which they will explain right now. Yeah, hi guys, my name is Pauline and I worked with Alina on this Instagram page. So for our civic action project, we chose to create an Instagram account because we know that a lot of people will use this platform like literally every day, wherever you look, people are on Instagram. So. I think it's the it's like the best platform that we we use so we can target our audience, which is high school teens. Um, Instagram would help us reach more people, which would allow us to educate them more about this issue because this is a very important issue to us and everyone else here, I believe. Um, Honestly, we had difficulty coming up with a name because we weren't really sure what name would fit us the best, but we ultimately came up with Immigrant Student Access Support because we believe that it really fits what we're doing. Um, and with this account, we intend to provide support for New York City immigrant high school students and other low-income students in New York City since they tend to be disadvantaged by the education system a lot. Um, so now we're gonna be passing it on to Alina. Um, informing the public was probably one of our biggest goals when creating this account. To highlight one of our previous posts, um, the history of immigration and immigrant students in, in New York City. Um, we researched the history of immigration and how it impacted immigrant students in New York, in New York City specifically. Um, by understanding the history behind the biases and lack of resources for immigrant students, we hope that we contributed to shaping a more informed audience. We have other posts directly related to helping immigrant students with scholarships, activities, and college resources. And we tried to pick opportunities that would not only help them succeed, but enjoy what they participate in because there's a program for everyone's niche. 
Um, our account is dedicated to our call to action goals, and we love it if you follow our page and stay updated. Very cool, guys. Um, so our next one is actually a TikTok video by Aisha and Mabel. Um, and so we're also centering around this same concept as well, which uh, they will explain right now. So um, we chose initially to create a TikTok because we thought it would be the most efficient and effective way to like reach the masses, um, especially like um, immigrant youth. Um, and the purpose of this um, like TikTok is to basically research and um, highlight um, uh, the information regarding immigrant students integration into New York City public school and essentially the lack of programs they have access to and just come up with like um, effective, um, like a call to action for these immigrant youth um, journey through higher education and um, primary education. Well, according to the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, nearly 40% of our residents are foreign born. In a city that has the largest public school system in the United States, one can imagine the amount of youth immigrants that attend New York City public schools are pretty large as well. Knowing this, you would expect for the New York City DOE to invest in programs to help accommodate these students in their transition and journey for formal education, but little to nothing has been done to help these students. And again, you guys can watch the rest um, on the website. So uh, our next okay. one is our... Are you sure if you wanna... Um... Um, I wanted to say like at the end of the video, you can see the organization that can help. Um, they, I'm just gonna say one of them. One of them is the NYC Department of Youth and Community Development, which is um, the DOI um, CD that provide after school programming and um, like um, community program for children and families. And then also the call of New York Council on um, American Muslim relatives. It's all at the end of the video. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So our next one is our call to action, which uh, Yovana will be explaining to us right now. Okay, so for our call to action, we created this item of some symbolic speech. Uh, it was designed by the FNC Immigrant Support Group with, uh, with special help from the 75 Republic. And this was created to take advocacy to the next level. So the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of the American dream as many immigrants come to the United States looking for a better life and education and the ability to gain knowledge in order to better oneself and grow as a civilization are extremely vital aspects of one's future. So as a result, the symbol embodies all of our immigrant communities, individual ambitions and aspirations. Um, so education is a fundamental human right that encourages individual freedom and empowerment. And despite uh, this fact, million of, million of, millions of immigrants, children and adults, many of whom are poor, are denied equal educational opportunities due to their legal status, impeding their ability to prosper and advance to their new home, which is the United States of America. So ways that we can help them is to support bills or programs that aim to help immigrant students re reach their educational goals. And as we've seen, as we, as we can see in the videos and the TikToks that we created and all the uh, research we've compiled, there are a lot of changes that could be made to better support immigrant students in New York. And if you have any more ideas that you want to see implemented, you can contact your representatives to let them know. So because their job is to serve the interests and needs of the constituents so that they want to hear from you and how you would make a change. And ways that you can find your representatives is to contact their info and you can use the links in the website to do that. And once you've found your representatives, you can make a call or send an email. 
and we have provided templates for you to do so. So we're encouraging advocacy because we want to guarantee that everyone in society has the opportunity to have their voices heard and to change society for the better. Thank you. Yeah, so basically uh, we thought that um, the laws and policy would be like one of the stronger like impacts that we can make uh, in terms of like uh, helping our immigrant students. Um, and so we think that like lobbying, like the laws, as well as like raising awareness to uh, to the, the laws that they recently passed that actually benefit like our immigrant students uh, will be very beneficial. Um, and yeah, now we're thinking questions. So anybody would like to ask a question. I would love to hear more about those three bills that were uh, mentioned at the end, uh, what, what those different bills would do to support immigrant students. Yeah, um, I can touch on that a little bit. Um, so the difficulty we found actually in this like call to action is that there aren't many bills that directly address this issue in New York, um, which is why we sort of wanted to have the idea that anyone can propose their own like change um, as well to their representatives because um, maybe this is a, not an issue that everyone is aware about. Um, let me, I can share my screen again really quickly. Um, so um, these, these first two bills, which are in the New York State Senate are more sort of like oriented towards keeping people's privacy, um, like especially in the school setting. Um, so this makes it so like, students that are immigrants in college and high school um, are able to like safely navigate those environments without their information um, being exposed to people that they don't want it to be. Um, there's also this really cool app called the New York State Dream Act, um, which basically allows undocumented students to qualify for financial aid. Um, but it's not something that everyone knows about. Um, and we notice there's sort of like less publicity on this issue. Um, but it's something that would benefit a lot of people in New York. So um, we wanted to like make sure that people knew about that and also ask the representatives to like um, make that more well-known. And Yassine has a question or comment. Yeah. Um... I really liked your presentation. I don't really have a question. As a as an immigrant student, everything like you guys were doing, it was like kind of talking about my story. I was like, this is so true. And I felt like um on my first year here, if I had these resources, it would have been so much easier for me. And I appreciate that you guys had um to think on other people's mind and be considered. So thank you so much. I hope all the um Students today will be able to benefit from all these opportunities that you guys put onto the website. Yeah, thank you so much, Yassine. Like, that really means a lot. You know, I'm an immigrant student as well. And obviously, like, you know, the path is, is definitely a lot harder for us, right? As far as, like, even, even though, like, learning English is pretty hard for me. And so like, I, definitely, I definitely, like, you know, understand how you feel. And, yeah, hopefully, like, this will impact, like, a lot more generations and upcoming generations as well. Um, also, I also wanted to show uh, a little bit of, of our quiz, is that, is that possible, Grace? Can we show our quiz? Yeah, it just goes out okay, do we have a minute? All right, cool. So, um, Fabrizio's group actually like uh, made this quiz. Fabrizio, uh, can you explain a little bit about what this quiz is about? Yeah, so this quiz basically is, um, it's basically testing you on like how much you know about immigration. Um, and this is something that I had researched previously because of my school as well as uh, due to this program. Um, and it's mostly just to like, I guess, figure out how many rights you have as an immigrant compared to like, um, a citizen, right? So like um, legal immigrant living in the United States against like a citizen. Perfect, thank you so much. And yeah, so that's our presentation.
Thank you so much, not only to this group, uh, but to all of the groups that presented. We heard from food uh, insecurity and food waste as a group. We heard from school segregation as a group, two groups on mental health and one on immigration. You've taught us so much. You've given us ideas of how we can get involved. And I wanna thank you all. Especially I wanna thank the students who created features and the calls to action in these websites. You worked so hard all year and Amanda highlighted some of the work that you've done. Uh, but there was so much that went into it. So I hope you're proud. I am, your TAs are proud of all that you've done. Um, turning, many of you came in knowing very little about what you were working on and you educated yourself and now you've educated other people. And now the next step is to become active citizens doing something about this. I especially wanna thank a few students who um, made it to every single civic leadership meeting this year, all 18. Those students showed incredible dedication and commitment to the project. Um, so I'm going to give a special shout out to Kiara Walters, Selena Lee, Cheryl Yang, Yasin Berry, Alejandro Alvarez Luna, and an honorable mention to two students who made it to all but one, and that is Serena Isler and Fabricio Asipo. You all not only get our big thanks and congratulations for just exceptional dedication and commitment, but you're also going to be getting a gift card as a um, award for your perfect attendance. So congratulations to those students. I also need to thank all of our TAs for all the work that they've done this year. Um, it's been a hard year for everybody adjusting to a post COVID world that turned out to not be all that post COVID after all, um, doing Zoom lessons and in-class things and getting COVID tests in the middle of their meetings, all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, and they brought you to the finish line. They worked so hard to make sure that each meeting was meaningful and um, effective, that you got things done and that you felt good about it. And they really made sure that what you produced in the end was exceptional, even while right now they are studying for finals and writing papers and taking exams. <laughs> they are working so hard um, in their own academic world, but they really put you guys at the, at the forefront. So thank you so much to all of our TAs. Of course, I wanna thank our professors who were uh, both here tonight and here in spirit. Um, for all of your work in the summer and for supporting our students throughout the year. And we'll see you again this summer. And the, the last person I wanna definitely thank is Amanda, our graduate coordinator. Um, Amanda really not only sat in on mentorship meetings with students in civic leadership meetings, was there all the time making sure things were running well. She was huge in making this website come together at the very last week and, and was editing things until today at 4.45 and even getting messages during this meeting telling her things needed to be changed and she's doing it all with a bright smile. So big, big thank you to Amanda. We're so glad she's gonna be with us again <laughs> next year. Um, so with that, uh, before we break up at all, uh, Amanda has some announcements for our outgoing students. We have a lot more to, to share in, in, in just a few minutes. So um, thank you to everybody and I'll turn it over to Amanda. Okay, so really quickly before I talk about um, the last things that we need you guys to do um, is I also really wanted to thank Jessica because she does an insane amount of work behind the scenes um, to make this um pro program work as seamlessly as possible it's unbelievable <laughs> the amount of things she can get done in one single day and i know um anyone who's ever asked her for something last minute and she's followed up with them i know you feel like sh she just has a great way of making everybody feel taken care of and seen and uh, heard while also balancing all of these responsibilities for everybody else um, so I just wanted to thank her too. She did more, more, much more than I did to put the website together and was working all weekend. So, um, and I know you guys all know how hard she works. Um, so the two last things, um, really two reminders. 
One is to RSVP to the graduation picnic. Um, remember, you can bring friends and family. There will be food, um, location food still to be announced, but um, fill out that form if you can make it. Um, and then we also, for the seniors, excuse me, yes, for the, <laughs> excuse me, for the current um, FNC group who's graduating. And then um, also for the current FNC group who's graduating, uh, here is the form to fill out your permanent email address. Remember, this is so important because this is how we keep in touch with you guys. We offer you upcoming alumni opportunities. We connect you with the incoming FNC students. Um, so, please fill out, take a moment to fill out both of those two forms. Um, and then quickly, I'm gonna turn it back to, do I turn it back to you, Jessica, or to Michaela? We have another uh, announcement from Michaela, who is our publicity liaison. Is that the right title, Michaela? That is a very fun, creative title. Hi, everyone. It was so amazing hearing everything that everyone's gone to do. and big things to Jess and Amanda. I know how tirelessly you two work. So basically, yeah, I do all most of the publicity for FNC and I've gotten to work with a lot of you on different newspaper articles and things like that. Um, we have a lot of really great stuff coming up this summer. I'm going to try to get us on some local news channels and things like that. So if you are a student incoming or outcoming, if you could put your name and email in the chat, that way I know if you're interested in future press opportunities, um, you don't have to say yes you know, I will give you the opportunity and you can decide from there. But just so I know who to contact in case you want to be interviewed for a newspaper or a magazine or on TV, um, any of the above, if you could just throw your name and email in the chat. And I look forward to getting to know you, but congratulations on a great year. Thank you, Michaela. Um, and you can see kind of all the news that she's gotten us lately, which has been really cool. Um, Let's see, I'll, I'll actually share, share my screen. Um, so at our alumna Deborah, we had, where did it go? Sage in the Amsterdam News, that was a big one. Um, and a few others very recently, which now I can't find, but they're all up on, on the internet. And it's a really cool opportunity just to talk about um, FNC and to hopefully teach more people about our work. So definitely drop your name and email address in the chat now if you'd be up for um, speaking to reporters, getting your name in the news in connection, which is a really cool thing to do. And you you don't have to say yes to everything she she no. gives you just by just because you put your name in the chat now. And I guess the other one thing I'll say is if I know we have a couple of students who are writers or who work at their newspaper at school, like if you ever want to do something like that and need someone to help coordinate it with FNC, feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. But if you have any questions PR publicity wise, I'm more than happy to help you too. Okay, thank you, Michaela. Um, so the next thing I want to tell to talk, uh, I want to share with our outgoing seniors are a few opportunities to stay in touch. So the, the big one that I want to mention to, to all of you is the Teagle Humanities Fellowship, which I know your TAs have mentioned to you before, but I really wanna put in one more plug. While the deadline was yesterday, they are extending the deadline. So if you didn't have a chance to apply, um, they haven't announced the final deadline yet, but put an application, over the weekend um, and you'll still have a, have a chance to apply for this. This is an incredible opportunity. The um, Teagle Humanities Fellowship is a chance to get paid $1,000 to read two books and write about it. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. So I hope you will all take advantage of it. Um, it's a little bit more than that, not just getting paid to read books, you'll be partnered with a, let me share my screen here. You'll be partnered with a former TA in FNC who will meet with you virtually um, about once a week over the course of the summer as you think through these texts, read about them, think about your own opinions and all of these things, um, and you write a paper. So it really helps you prepare for college level writing. You'll be in a much better place when you enter college. It helps you think about 
all of the things that are going on here and that's whether that's COVID or race relations or the war in Ukraine, like anything you want, it's there. Um, and you'll get to print your essays on our the um, FNC and the um, main website. So this is definitely something you should do. This is for seniors now, but juniors next year, this opportunity will be there for you. I'll make sure of it. So think about it for our juniors, seniors, definitely apply this weekend if you're still interested. They've extended the deadline. So pretty amazing. Everybody who's done it has been excited about it. All right. Um, that is just one of many opportunities you can take advantage of if you are an alumni um, of our program. I'm putting in the chat kind of the main page on our website which has a few other opportunities. You'll see there's a whole program for college sophomores and juniors that you'll want next year to apply for, that there are lists of scholarships, fellowships, jobs, internships, whatever it is. We hope that you will think of us, FNC, as a place to go for resources for the rest of your life. We're, I am still in touch with students from the class of 2009 when we first started. So, I hope that you won't become strangers. I hope you will stay in touch with us forever. We have annual reunions in a non-COVID world where we'll invite you back to campus to have dinner and celebrate and catch up with each other. We have other events throughout the year, um, including scholarships and fellowships that you can take advantage of. And I wanna let you know just one other part is that something really exciting about freedom and citizenship is that we've been helping other universities and colleges start programs on our model. This summer, there are going to be 20 colleges that started programs like ours. Um, Professor Tweel, who's here as well, has been huge in making this happen. Not, and why should you care about that? Well, there might be a program on your college campus next year, and you might want to be a TA for that program we can make that connection happen. We have some students who are now TAs in the Fordham program, for instance, this summer. So um, keep in your head the Knowledge for Freedom Network. That's where all of our programs live and there will be more opportunities to engage with Knowledge for Freedom programs that are just like ours. All right. Wow, those are all the examples I had to give. So I guess now I have to just say goodbye, which is really painful. Um, especially this year when we didn't get to have in-person things as much as we wanted to ever since the summer. I truly mean that I'm not going to forget you, that I want to be here for you throughout your college experience. Transitioning to college is difficult, but it's not impossible. And if you ever need help, if you ever are struggling, if you're ever thinking, I don't know how to do this, please come back, please send us an email. Slack will still exist um, and we'll make this better for you. We have an incredible network of alumni who are here to support each other and we want you to succeed. We wanna cheer on your college graduation in four or five years and know that you know, the kind of boot camp you went through this summer helped you a little bit in that adjustment. So please don't be strangers. Please fill out that form with your permanent email address so we can make sure you aren't strangers. And uh, for the seniors who are vaccinated, we are very much looking forward to seeing you at our graduation picnic on May 23rd. Thank you to everybody once again, professors, TAs, incoming students, outgoing students, everybody who makes freedom and citizenship happen. I'll be sticking around if anybody has questions, thoughts, concerns before we say good night. Um, but this is goodbye to everybody until we see each other again. Good night.